most delighted. I'm always intrigued when I have to talk about her because I think that was one woman that did womanhood proud. You know, you have rapid changes, urbanization, and uh, uh, in, in, in the case of Lagos, even right to the doorstep of, the, of our palaces. Well, you know, I have a mentor and, uh, and an icon that I want to emulate, and that was Erelukuti the first. Erelukuti is unique to Lagos. But you know, Erelukuti in Lagos, Erelu in Lagos is Erelukuti and it is totally different because she actually created a second dynasty. She is not just an honorary title. She was a princess, a, a queen mother, a king's mother, and she created a, dinner, a second dynasty that gave right to children of female royals to be kings. Yes, I'd be most delighted. I'm always intrigued when I have to talk about her because I think that was one woman that did womanhood proud and that um, I would almost call her an unsung heroine. Her powers, her achievements and her impact really should be in the public domain. But thanks be to God, we are now putting it there and we are now remembering her and talking about her contribution. You know, uh, she was third of three children of King Ado of Lagos and uh, was the only child of her own mother. You know, kings, they have several oloris, you know, and uh, she was the only one of her own child. And uh, history had it that, you know, um, the mother who was the queen of Lagos and the Oluri of King Adu was suffering from um, uh, either infant mortality or inability to um, keep her pregnancy or her children usually would die at birth and I suspect that she must have been suffering from the sickle cell amenia um, uh, syndrome which of course were not known at the time and uh, 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 although she was quite concerned the other two was concerned that his bride has not uh, had any uh, uh, care for him on, on the throne so they now sent her father, and she was daughter of King Goshi uh, in the southwest Tampag uh, kingdom of uh, of the Yoruba of the Yoruba race. And the her, her parents, who were concerned, decided to send some fetish from her father's kingdom to Lagos to come and pray for her to appease the gods and all that so she could have children and that the children would survive. So hence was the beginning of the Orishas as we know them today that formed the uh, Adam Orisha cultural festival. And the Orishas that were sent from her father's uh, kingdom were the Adimu uh, Uniko and Ologede to come and make appeasement uh, for her. And when they got here, it was King Akishimoi. Uh, when they got here, the king uh, received them and gave them a, a, a place to stay while they were taking care of his uh, Uluri. And they remain in Lagos ever since. And the quarters where they live in um, uh, that access the Ulubani compound and all that exists till today. You can see them there. And so, when finally she conceived and the baby uh, lived, 
And that baby that lived is, is the, the baby is the Irebukuti first. And when the baby arrived, of course, the, the, the fetish and their followers went to the king to break the good news. And that's where you had the slang, mo yofu and mo yofu rami. Because it's their family as much as it is wife of the king, you know. So that slang of mo yofu and mo yofu rami came into being. And uh, of course, she had a beautiful girl who became a Lukuti of Lagos, a very strong woman. And we were told that from childhood she was beautiful and very uh, dynamic uh, young person and uh, grew up with those traits and she was given Irelu Kuti actually it's not the full name Ikuti Kuti was the name that was given to her but we have shortened it to Kuti uh, today but of course you know what that means in Yoruba that all these dead deaths that have been it's not going to happen again. That's the end of it. Nobody will die anymore. And then, of course, she, as she grew up, she and her parents left. So she was, of course, saddled with her brother. And uh, her first brother reigned, uh, Gabaru reigned in Lagos. And, of course, he died in test without any heir, heir to the throne. So the brother, Akishimoni, took on the throne and reigned. And during that reign, he got very close to his sister who was very uh, supportive of him and uh, and was side by side with him through, through all, all the trials that he went through while he was king. He was, uh, you know, part of what happened while he was king, he was banished to um, Badagri and while he was away, uh, she was able to quell the revolt of the chiefs who wanted to take over the throne of Lagos. And uh, she succeeded in, in keeping the throne and that's where her regency of the throne uh, started from. <laughs> so, and then of course, she was able to help him to sustain the throne. And while he was away, she acted as his regent and custodian of the throne and refused to allow anybody to usurp the rights of the king, of the royalties of Lagos. And then on another occasion, he was able to save his face by marrying one of his uh, uh, greatest confidants and supporter, Alagba. When his daughters, when Oba Kishimoni's daughters refused to fulfill the pledge of their fathers to Alagba, who was his confidant and his champion, Irelukuti again came to the rescue of his brother by volunteering to marry uh, Alagba, and um, through whom she now had two sons of her own. But even before that, when her father was alive, she used to be the one that would uh, interface with the foreign traders who came to Lagos. In fact, this came to a head during the time of Obaki Shomoyi again. Uh, the Oba, of course, does not go to the port, and the trusted person who interfaced was the Relukuti. So whatever goods or things they bring to the port, it's a Lukuti that will remove the choices which she will bring to the brother at home and keep some for herself. So she was just a champion of sustaining the throne uh, of Lagos and the integrity uh, of Lagos. She, um, and I think one of the greatest feats she performed at that time uh, uh, that, uh, that I consider was two things. You know, we have a, a democratic uh, system of governance uh, in Lagos, maybe not in the modern sense, because you have a democratic system operating under the leadership of the monarchy, was the system we had before colonialists or 
the or what the even the Portuguese traders found on the ground when they came. And the Lady Oshibo was more or less the legislative uh, arm of government. And it was just purely a preserve of men. You do not have women participation. But after the demise of uh, Obaki Shemoy, uh, everyone wanted uh, the young, her younger son to be king because he was more popular. But she felt that was not equitable. The rightful owner to the, the person to that throne should be the eldest. And then she got the wind that at the in Lady Oshubo, they were trying to manipulate this thing. So she got up and stormed the conclave, where you know was forbidding for women to to enter. So I thought that was bravery in its essence for her to go in there because she wanted to be sure that what was right was done and justice was uh, meted out to her children. And she went and stormed the place. Of course, they were shocked, they were aghast, but that was the queen mother. They could not, um, was a strong princess of Lagos and they couldn't just turn her back. And from that day on, she had a seat there and the seat existed today. And all subsequent Redukuti sits on that throne as the, uh, as the only female in the Lady Yoshibu of Lagos where cases and things were uh, determined. So, for me, I think she now gave a voice to women in the affairs of their, of their, of their community. But I think the, to, the, the crowning glory of all of this is that to resolve the issue between her sons, she actually now had both of them crowned on the same day at Enuawa where we crown kings, which still existed today. Enuawa is still where you crown the kings and some senior uh, traditional chieftains in Lagos City today. And on that same day, well, she, he, he, history had it that when her two brothers died, she felt she had a right also to the throne. She crowned herself. And of course, to the um, shock of everybody, you know, and all that. But to appease everyone, she now handed the throne uh, to give the, her crown to her first son, Ologun Kuteri. And her second son was given all the paraphernalia of an oba, except the crown. She was given a white, uh, he was given a white cap, but with a difference because he was entitled to the paraphernalia of an oba, not just like any other white cap, you know. You know, you go to Lagos now, and if our ancestors came back to life and go through the way Lagos is now, they'd be shocked because Lagos was clean. You wake up every morning and sweep the environment of your home. And you just don't leave the rubbish there on the, on the street. You pack it into uh, whatever you, you, you have. We all, we all have disposable drums and things where we put our, our rubbish. We didn't even have the privilege of plastic bags, but you will have a container where you put all your rubbish. And then having packed it, you just don't leave it lying around in your home. A dump is provided by the town council you know, and you take it, whether it's far or near your house, you take it there and dump it there. And during the day, the staff of the town council will come and cut them away. So that's how organized the system of getting rid of, of, of refuse was. And then it's not just that you sweep your environment and pack all the rubbish away. You know, we all, the drainages and infrastructure were not our forte at that time. So whatever drainage is running through your home must be clean. And, it, 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 and everyone does that every day. But we are not left to our own device alone. Members of the town council, we call them Wole Wole, will come and check to be sure that you have cleaned your environment. So for me, I keep hammering on cleanliness of Lagos because no one will believe that we were that clean, but we were. And I do hope that we will go back and take a leaf from that and start cleaning up 
uh, Lagos. For me, that was the most significant thing. A, a clean environment that kept disease away from Lagos. And of course, there was that degree of honesty. You could leave your wares in the market, you come back and found them. And if they are sold, you'll find your money right there on, 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 on your basket. No one will take them away, no one will steal them. So you have cleanliness, you have integrity, and we had love. If you're going on the road and your car breaks down, within seconds, four or five hefty people will join to help you fix your car or whatever, and they will just do it as a matter of fact, and once it's done, they go on their own merry way. Nobody stops and says, you have to give me something before I help you. We just instinctively help one another. And we are happy, we just thank you very much for your help. Nobody asks for gratification. That's the Lagos I grew up in. And you can tell, you know, it's a fire cry from that. And there are so many positive things that we grew up in Lagos. Good name, upholding the dignity and honor of your families, and knowing that uh, affluence is a result of sheer hard work and hard work in, in honesty and in, in uh, sincerity of purpose. You know, um, I can go on and on. So you can imagine some of us who have lived this long, how our heart breaks every day with all sort of things that are happening today. But maybe we should try harder, look inward, and try and bring back the good old days. And how, how has it shaped your role in preserving the culture and history of Lagos? Well, I, I, I like the way you put it because Relukuti, we all know what Relukuti stands for, the mother of the kings, herself, the queen mother herself, and all that. But what does it mean to me? For me, it's a, it gives me, it's a platform. It's a platform, almost an instrument for me to add value to my culture, to my reality, to my being as a human being. Uh, I, 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 I see it as a platform to fulfill my love, my desire for my culture, to sustain the integrity of my culture, to uphold the integrity of my, of my culture and to showcase the beauty of the culture and tradition of Lagos. That's what a Kuti means to me. Just ordinary, uh, more, uh, away from the ordinary meaning and the prestige of the, of the position. For me, I see it as an instrument to be able to uh, use my love, my talent, to be able to sustain the beauty, the integrity of who we are as Africans because our culture, our tradition is what we are. And unless we admit it and work at it and build on it, improve on it, and make it acceptable to the world, then I would have failed. My culture is my identity. My culture is opportunity to promote the economic empowerment and strength of my culture, of my environment. You know? It's an instrument of empowerment for me, empowerment of others, of empowerment of the youth, sustenance of the history, the rich history of my ancestors. That's what the Relu title means to me. It's not just for fancy and, you know. Yes, Thank yes. You very much. Thank yes. You very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Your mm. Thank you very much. How does the role Erelu evolved over the years, and what key responsibilities come to its position today? Well, I uh, want to thank God for using me as an instrument of enlightenment of the position of Erelu in Lagos, because I think prior to now. You know, we have a song, Wani, uh, they say, Erelu Iyaoba, Erelu Iyaoba, 
kin ro gro kin ro ko kin ro do ile lo tin fi eso tun aye se so you know what it means it means she just sits on her grand throne and from there she conduct the affairs of the world and her children and all that yes it was good like that in those days because in those days she she she, she the relu is the head of all women and women affairs she's the head of all the markets she's the head of all most of the economic uh, activities because even when the foreigners bring the goods to the port she's the one who receive them and if you are a friend of Irilu you get a whole lot of wares to sell and be part of the economic uh, activities that was uh, happening at that time so she can afford to sit at home because the proceeds will be taken to her if she wants pepper, of course, they will fall over each other to bring it. If she wants goats, the goat sellers will fall over themselves to please the redu and bring it to her. But you know, with time, that evolved. And um, those people, uh, with the way the economy turned out, they probably didn't even have enough for themselves and their families to now talk of giving to. Uh, it wasn't even just the redu, they give to the others. But you see, if I, at my time, sat down at home trying to solve the problem of the world, I would only just be adding more problems to problems. Because then, in their little, in their meager resources, they will have to sustain my position before they even sustain themselves. So, which meant that position will have to shift. Operation of the position of Irelu will have to evolve. And which meant that I had to go out there. Not only to wait for anybody to sustain my my living i have to sustain my my own life but not just mine and including theirs because so when i sit at home let it take care of my people i have to also give them sustenance rather than waiting for them to give me sustenance so it means that erelu cannot afford to stay at home again she has to be out there slugging with everybody for economic emancipation for herself and even for her subjects because things have become difficult a lot of the land that they used to farm in lagos have been allocated out and it's now a jungle of concrete and uh, abodes for people timid people who are coming into lagos even the waters that we fish in are polluted and with um, uh, fossil with, with uh, emission for fossil fuel and from um, desecration from uh, uh, human waste so even these species have dwindled so even their natural trade is no longer as buoyant as it used to be so the oba the relu is looked upon to be able to add value as father as mother of the people you have to help your children, you have to devise um, innovative ways, imaginative ways to be able to help them. So that way for sure, uh, the, 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 the rain and the rule, a life of very little pretty uh, has changed and evolved tremendously. And then, but most importantly also, uh, the discipline of that institution, of the King's Palace, is and thrust it upon the Irelu. And you know, these days, you know, we talk about BB Ray, once you are giving birth to, you are trained, you to imbibe that kind of behavior. I was talking about cleanliness, you know, you know that you have to clean your environment, which meant at that time, we just don't take paper and throw it on the floor, or we don't take banana peel and throw it on the floor. So part of that is an added responsibility to her to be sure that that lack of discipline on keeping it she has to be sure that the environment is clean behavior you, you behave in a proper way the wives of the palace are they follow the straight and narrow part and they do they behave the way they are supposed to be seen and and so it, it, it's been one responsibility replaced with another much more enormous and much more demanding uh, with time. I think it's part of what I've just touched now that you know you have rapid changes, urbanization, and uh, uh, in, in, in the case of Lagos, 
even right to the doorstep of the of our palaces you have people who, who do not know about our history who did not know about our, our past who did not know about our norms and protocols and practices are living close to us so their ways of life are totally alien to ours and but we cannot allow things to degenerate or to lose its content and its value so it meant that custodians of uh, culture and tradition like us especially when you talk about the kingdom because we we are support in the past you only had the upper of lagos from the atlantic to the border of Ugu state so we had all the responsibility of all these areas where you have uh, uh, upgraded chiefs who are now traditional rulers that are, at least some of them are taking care of some areas it used to be the responsibility of the other so naturally they really had to uh, uh, assist him because you see the white cap chiefs they are they are they they must they contend with their own uh, 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 their own palaces their own homes they try to maintain all the pr protocols in their own uh, uh, palaces but the palace of the upper the owners is on the upper they review to maintain the standard to ob observe the protocols and to enlighten the newcomers into lagos about the way we do things and how, about how we should sustain an equitable and egalitarian uh, uh, society and that was what the gadu stood for a rallying point for all the people who come to lagos and that was why also we we just don't honor only Lagosians. We honor foreigners, um, Nigerians from different parts of the country. Once they've done well and they've added to uh, value to Lagos, we recognize them, we honor them, and they all see the palace of the Oba of Lagos as their home also. And, and they felt at home, and they felt that they are part of the bigger uh, Lagos uh, family. And we were able to live in peace. If you look at the whole of Nigeria, considering the number of people and the, the, the different uh, peoples who habit Lagos, we've been able to sustain peaceful coexistence and a lot of peace in, in Lagos. Thank you very much. Well, we'd like to know about your experience. Tell us about your experience having been on the show for 15 years. Tell us about your experience. Well, I, kept, uh, I get asked this question often. But you know, when you ask me and when I look back, oh, of course it's been bittersweet, but all I can see is the positive aspect of these 50 years. Because I think uh, when you believe in the calling that you've been called upon to do, and you love what you do, you try not to dwell on the negativity. If anything, you try to even move past it. So for me, I can just remember a whole lot of good times, a lot of positive contribution, a lot of achievement. For instance, one of the first things I did, at that time, we, the local government were not really uh, really contributing not as they are now you know we, we didn't even have the states there was no Le lagos state we are more or less under the it was the federal capital so the sort of support we get is usually from the head of state who resided in in lagos so I, I remember that i used to actually take the broom and sweep the palace myself i used to change the furniture in the palace. Whenever we have to receive anybody, I remember myself and some others will contribute to celebrate and to, to you know. And those days used to give me joy when I walk into the palace and it's dirty. I take the broom, I start sweeping. Of course, when I start sweeping, everybody will run and say, ah, yes. I say, yes, but don't help me. Don't take the broom from me. It should have been done, you know. And so part of what one did was to now enlighten them about how to sustain our place, about maintenance culture, uh, you know. And we did a lot in the Gadugon so that everybody, whenever you came into the, the palace, it was good. And of course, I had my own palace, uh, 
the palace of Irelukuti. Small, because the whole family have taken it over, and as Irelu, I, I had my other home, so, but it was still being maintained, you know? And then, of course, the very first thing I did was discover, then after the creation of state, we were being given, I think, 60 pounds. The chiefs were being given 60 pounds uh, a month. Imagine even Lagos of that day. These are the people that anything that's happening in, 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 in the country or in Lagos, because Lagos was the federal capital. So if anything was happening in the country, it starts from here. And it's the chiefs, it's the Oba and the chiefs that they want to be seen in those, that uh, people want to see in those places. And even their uh, attire alone or maintenance of their palaces, what can that do? Nothing. So I took it upon myself uh, to actually fight for the enhancement and the increase in the remunerations that are being given to the chiefs in Lagos. And I think it was at the point where you had Elijah Okunu as deputy governor, who, who is the daughter of the soil and all that, that I was able to compile maybe like 10 pages letters with uh, some of the chiefs. I think the chiefs that came with me at that time was led by uh, Chief Olua of Lagos at the time. Uh, and so we led the delegation and that. To cut a long story short, after all that, the salaries were, were, were increased to uh, from I think 600 to about 20,000. And they were also given allowance to be able to have a chauffeur, a, a driver. To drive, to drive them. So that for me, and when that was happened, it was not just that the, the, the salaries of the chiefs that were increased, the salaries of the Oba was increased, and this affected all the Obas in the states and, and people of that category, chiefs of that category in the whole of the state. And for me, I thought that was one of my <laughs> greatest achievements, um, you know. And, and since then, we, we, we've done quite a bit. I'll give you some of my brochures that has part of what I have uh, done ever since. And definitely in the area of conflict resolution, I think we did a lot of that in Lagos and actually extended it to the National Traditional Rulers uh, Council, where we got all traditional rulers of this country together under one umbrella and uh, tried to forge brotherhood, conflict resolution mechanism into place to assist government and, and all that. And I remember the first outing that I succeeded in doing in bringing all the traditional rulers together was when I brought them to Lagos under the governorship uh, time of the current president of Nigeria in Lagos. He, I remember he hosted them and I even made him to give them gifts and all that, and everybody were so delighted. And some of the kings said they've never really left their kingdom or meet other kings from other parts of Nigeria. And for them, that was something they considered amazing. And you know. Well, you know, I have a mentor and, uh, and an icon that I want to emulate, and that was Elelukuti the first. I told you she broke the bounds of uh, uh, male uh, exclusivity and dom domineering of the polity. She, by breaking into their conclave, she gave women a voice. And although she was one amongst men, but whatever she says there, it's really representing all women. And when she goes out and tells the women in those days, and said, this is what they said though, but this is what I told them that the women will stand for. And all of them will support her and say, yes, if that's what you say, we support you. So that one voice in the Oshugbo Conclave stands for thousands of voices. And that's strengthened her position and made her a formidable person within the polity at that point in time and gave room. And that for me, it's height of emancipation for women uh, in Lagos. And in Lagos, we also recognize that the woman is the head of all women, should be the head of all women organization and definitely the markets. And through that, a lot of women rose into prominence as leaders in the markets. You, you have um, 
and uh, the, uh, the Bombata lady you had, Elijah Mogaji you had. Those are th that was this the the, the the stage from which they all catapulted from. She set up that and gave women voice. This is in Lagos, and you know, in Lagos, a woman was the, 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 a woman rose to be the first deputy governor of, of, of this country, of all the states in this country. So women got empowered from that beginning, and Sky, they are still rooting, and I'm sure the first president, female president of this country, will come from Lagos because we've been exposed, we've been emancipated for a long time, and I see continue to champion it. Um, the last uh, International Women's Day, we had a, a, a reception for them here where we actually empowered a lot of women through funding, through uh, job creation and, and so many. So we continue to do that uh, in Lagos. Well, as Erelu, you know, Erelu Kuti, you see, now, Erelukuti is unique to Lagos because you see we have we thank, thanks to we thank God that a lot of people uh, love what we do and they have also created this tool of Erelus in their palaces and all that. But you know Erelukuti in Lagos, Erelu in Lagos is Erelukuti and it is totally different because she actually created a second dynasty. She is not just an honorary title. She was a princess, uh, a queen mother, a king's mother, and she created a dinner, a second dynasty that gave right to children of female royals to be kings in Lagos. So that alone put her in a very special position because it means she is a queen, a crowned queen. And no, they didn't want to crown her, but she was. She had the right, and she crowned herself. And it was that crown that she used to create a second dynasty. If you remember, her husband was Alagba from Malaysia. So her children didn't take the crown from her, from their fathers. They took her crown. And it is her crown that they use, that they are using till tomorrow. And that puts her in a totally different position. And the tradition in Lagos is that even the crown king on the throne treats her with utmost courtesy because he derives his right from her. So whenever you have an Erelukuti on the throne, that is the courtesy she enjoys within the kingdom. She sits on the throne also because that's also happened. She sat on the throne throughout her life, gave her crown to one, gave one to the other, and she sat in the middle and administered Lagos. She was so strong that even the one that was crowned, Asoba, almost tried to poison her and be rid of her because she was high-handed and too strong. And you know, when you are a cabbage, you don't want to defer to anybody. You are the voice of the Almighty. And then to have one woman, especially the way we consider women in our own uh, environment, and to have one who is so strong enough because she bequeathed your right to you, and you have no choice but to give her respect. That is the position of a relukuti in the royal uh, monarchical system of Lagos. Well, I think our life, I'm using royal, royal plural, rather than saying in my life, uh, I have been exposed to different parts of the world and I can actually testify to the fact that my love, I've always loved my root, my culture, my heritage, even from childhood, because my parents brought us up to be proud of who we are, you know? And if you try to, my father would not even let us go to the neighbor's house. If you do, they would probably say, what's wrong with you, low breed? He would say that you must comport yourself and be happy and satisfied with who you are and what you have. So your home should be your castle and you should be happy there. So we were not allowed to. So from childhood, you were reminded of who you, you are and to be proud of it. And when I went to different parts of the world, which I, I had opportunity to do, I realized that, yes, they have their own culture, but my culture is just as beautiful, if not better. And so wherever I go, I try to showcase, even long before I became a real, 
to showcase what I have, to let them realize that, yes, I love what you are, but I will not ape your own. I may, I may borrow part of it. I may even imbibe it, vibe your culture. But that does not mean at the deterrent of who I am. Because the world has become a global village and we all take and give from what all our realities. But that does not mean you should get to see who you are and what your own identity is for another. For another. And so I, I think a lot of people, even by my own essence and my own uh, way of life, they've realized that really there should not be a confusion from what you, your realities are and what to copy from other people. And that yours is just as important and as good and as beautiful. Rather than the way they try to brainwash us as colonialists, that what is ours is fat, ugly, illiterate, everything that's negative. And theirs is the, is the way of life. We existed before they came. We had order and a system of life before these people came. We, we, we had our own God and our own way of reaching the Almighty before they came. So they didn't come and teach us about the Almighty God. We already believe in the Almighty God. So we all had different ways to reach each other. I'm talking about champion of my culture and other, but I also chose another form of religion to reach my Almighty God. Because I find it easier for me to, 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 to reach the Almighty. But that does not say that I look down on my own reality. Like I always say again, every grouping, they all have miscreants, people who do things wrongly. It's not just the traditionalists who do things wrongly. You have it in all other religions, all other major religions. So it is for us to take out the negative part, take what is positive and run with it. And I think I did that. I'm full view of everybody and I know I have a whole lot of comfort, com convert who are imbibing this. And especially young people, because they come to me, they ask questions, how do you cope with this? And how do you just do this? And I said to them, it's simple. Just love yourself, love your identity. So, and I also adopt another method. They were, we were brainwashed to believe we are not good. I think we should also adopt that method, which I have done to brainwash ourselves back to believing that in fact, they were wrong. What we are, is actually the best. For me, I think they are all just time wasters. And that kind of argument is unnecessary, is uncalled for, is not productive. It's meaningless. Who came for who didn't come for? What does that mean? We all have our different stories. For instance, I can tell you the front, my own the, the, the story for me. The Awaris came and stopped at Isheri. And from Isheri, they, they came from Benin, hunters and farmers, uh, not Benin, the hunters and farmers, they came from Ilefe and looking for greener pastures. And when they, 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 the farmer said, okay, you continue to go. The most prosperous area will be where your, uh, your divination sinks or sank, whatever. And uh, so this happened at Isheri. It was an incident. It happened there. And when it happened there, from there, also, you know, human beings, you see, want even a better situation. So quite a number dispersed into the interland of the Yoruba areas. Some went almost as far as uh, uh, Oyo uh, area. And some came to Ido, uh, uh, to Ido here, uh, on the other side, uh, by the lagoon. Now, you have another group that left Ilefe. Hmm? And if you go and look in the history, the Yorubas, the Benins, they came parallel, not crisscrossing each other. So I don't think there's any way you can say you have the Yoruba and the Benin war or anything like that. They, because they were all from the same route and they came parallel looking for greener pastures. Now, the the, 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 the Oromiyo left Ilefe, became king in Benin. His descendant came to Lagos and became king in Lagos. But they came, they didn't come through Isheri. 
they came through the waterfront because you can see their legacies as they came you have worry you have all the riverine settle settlement and they came into lagos from the water and if you come into lagos proper lagos island if you look at all the, contrary to all, some of the stories that are not uh, 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 substantiated they came in through the water and all the relics on the island are of Bini relics. You have from Idumota, you have from Ibute, Idugoron, Idumota, Idunshagbe, Idoluwo, uh, all the way to Oshodi. And then we know uh, uh, the people who came to Oshodi, they are not their worried descendants. You know the ones in Boko Aguda, they are not their worried. They, are, they were people that were giving settlements by the Oba as they came. Don't quite good where the returning slaves from different places, but they prefer to stay in Lagos and the other gave them a land to settle. So if you look at all of that, there is no one relic of Awori settlement in that place. The only relics that you can say are the people who crossed from Ido onto the island. And we were told that when they came, the Bini made them to play, pay royalty to pay Ishakole. So it meant somebody was there already when they told you that you should pay. All right? Now, you see, I have told this story, but for me, it's stupid. Because if you have the uh, Awori who settled Latido, and you have these people who came from the water and they are here, so they could have even arrived at the same time, but one on the other side of the lagoon, one on the other side of the lagoon. And when they decided to cross the lagoon and start interacting, What's wrong with that? So it's placing the time of any consequence or when they go to Ido or when we go to the island. The fact remains that you cross over and the one who cross over to, to the, uh, the side of the lagoon was made to pay royalty. That cannot be controverted, it's there, black and white. I'm sure everybody knows that they were. So whether it was con from conquering or from whatever, the fact remains that that happened. And Examples of this abounds in history. The Queen of England is from the House of Hanover, Hanover from Germany. Today, they are, the, they are the number one British in England. Even if it was done by conquest, but they took, they have the rights of the island and the kingship. And therefore, you know, so for me, uh, that this narration, I'm just trying to say what, we, but really, it should not be a source of argument between us because you have the white captives who are supposed to be children who are supposed to be a worry but what we have in lagos when they cross over are the white captives and the obas that's what we have in lagos we have the dangers and we have the obership we do not have a worry in the context of the way we are talking about it today on lagos island lagos state yes we are talking about Lagos. What I'm talking about is Lagos Echo. And when people are talking, they don't explain it. It's like they are talking about Lagos Echo. But when you're talking about Lagos State, of course, you have a lot of settlements that form the Ibile in Lagos. They belong into their worries. But we are not going to start who arrived first or who didn't arrive with that because the creation of the state was only in 67. So if you are saying that the people who, about who came centuries ago and you are comparing the worry who came within the uh, uh, amalgamation of uh, Ibilas to make a state, then you know clearly who came first. So for me, I would like to appeal to people that this is an unnecessary argument. It is just helping to create dichotomy between us and to endanger our peaceful co coexistence. So for me, it's something that should be swept under the, not under the carpet, swept away completely, you know. Thank you very much, we are so grateful for this interview. Well, I would like to ask, like, what advice do you have for the younger generations, encouraging them to be inquisitive about their roots, most especially um, children from Lagos Island. Most times you ask them, where are you from? They know they are from Lagos Island. Where in Lagos Island are you from? They don't even know their compound. They don't know their compound name. So, what advice uh, do you have for the younger generations? What I, uh, the advice is more to their parents and some of the elders who know the story, who are still alive. 
that they shouldn't allow this to die. Their children who are already enlightened should organize writers to listen to oral stories from these people, document them, and find a way to get government to, to, to sponsor and give them free to schools, especially schools on Lagos Island and people of uh, Lagos Island origin. Because you see, with time, they won't know where they are from. And since you have people who, you know, L Lagos Island is a golden egg. You, you know, and everybody likes uh, beautiful things. It's a beautiful child and everybody wants to own a beautiful child. And so you have the clamor for ownership of Lagos. Even this story about argument who came for behind it, you find that it's not the original people who are behind this. It's those people who want to come in through the back uh, corner to own Lagos. So if we don't want our children to be disenfranchised because they have nowhere else to go, we need to document all of these things. We need to teach it in the schools. And us, that's why I've set up a foundation where we teach just the, 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 the Yoruba language at uh, our foundation to young to young people to even uh, adults like you because a lot of us can't speak Yoruba properly so we need to and if we can't and what do we I'm sure some of you have children what do we teach our children then we don't even know so some of us including me must continue to push and enlighten uh, 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 everybody else to know about their origin their root their language we've all made mistakes when they when we were going to school they tell us you cannot speak yoruba or your native language is vernacular and we all fell for it so a lot of us didn't speak uh, our local uh, languages but enough is enough our language is our identity our language is our wealth our language is what tells the world who we are so we must go back to the drawing board and make sure we all speak Yoruba and we all speak Igbo, we all speak Hausa because once we know who we are, we cannot sit on a round table with pride and sincerity of purpose to say, okay, this is who I am, this is who you are. God has put us together in one boat. So how do we now use what we, ha ha what we are to have a meeting point where we can exist and coexist in peace prosperity and love and respect for one another you know because nigeria ain't going nowhere we are we have found ourselves in this boat and we are going to make the best of it and the best of it is in our togetherness not in our separate in fact if we, if any of us should go separate now from nigeria some of our neighboring com, 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 countries are getting bigger they will just overrun them and we become uh, fractionalized and then lose our identity completely. So really, we need to let ourselves know the danger of breaking into, into pieces. Our strength is in being together. We've been together for so long. We've been able to sustain it till now. And we should just try harder and, be, and have sincerity of purpose, integrity to rule this country. We have so much. We have so, God has endowed us with so much that is enough for everybody. We just need to manage it in an honest, sincere way for everybody to benefit, not just one person cutting everything away.